Hi, I'm Brian Phillips, Chief Strategy Analyst for Honda of America. I'm here today to discuss the comprehensive strategic analysis for Honda Motor Company. I'd like to start off today by thanking the Board of Directors. I appreciate you guys giving me the time to discuss via teleconference my strategy for Honda Motor Company. Today's presentation will consist of a few items delving into the strategy of Honda as well as the current position of Honda. We will start with the current performance assessment of Honda Motor Company, go into the central issues facing the automotive industry, talk about the key strategic issues and organizational challenges facing Honda, go into the corporate profile and defining strategic characteristics, discuss Honda's SWOT analysis, and then I will go into my specific strategy, going into the recommendations, as well as the implementation methodology, evaluation metrics, and then finally, closing remarks. So to start off, I'm going to go into the current performance of Honda Motor Company. Honda is comprised of six regions in a matrix organizational structure. The North American market is super saturated with 50% of the company's revenue coming from just their sales. 9.4% of the market share in the U.S. is claimed by Honda. Honda is a high volume sales leader in the Asian motorcycle market, but one of the issues that they're having, not only I guess in North America, but around the world is declining sedan sales as the prices of gas go down. I'm now going to discuss the current performance of Honda Motor Company. Honda Motor Company is comprised of six operational regions in a matrix organizational structure. The North American market is super saturated with 50% of Honda's global sales. 9.4% of that market is Honda within North America. Honda is a high volume sales leader in the Asian motorcycle market. One of the issues that's affecting Honda and the rest of the industry is declining sedan sales in North America as gas prices continue to fall. The growing market presence within China is another thing that Honda has encountered recently. 24% year-over-year sales growth and 1.25 million units in fiscal year 16. Recent success in emerging brick markets has also been prevalent around the world. The next thing I will discuss is the auto industry in 2017. The industry is in a state of turbulence. There are five major challenges identified by IHS Automotive that are currently facing the industry. The first is opportunity and risk within the Chinese auto market. The second is advent of connectivity and vehicle electrification. The third issue is finding sources of growth and heightened competition. The fourth is balancing the demands of technology and regulations. And the last issue is consolidation of vehicle architecture into mega platforms. Adapting to all these variables can be extremely difficult and is the reason, one of the reasons why Honda needs to look into other strategies. I'll now go into the organizational challenges that are specific to Honda. So earlier this year, as you all know, Honda changed leadership. And during that leadership change, Mr. Hachigo outlined a new vision for Honda for the year 2030. The five focus areas outlined in his plan include strengthening global and regional models, enhancing design and consumer driving experience, balancing global operations and supply chain networks, enhancing introduction of vehicle electrification, and finally initiating the integration of advanced safety technologies. All of these challenges are in response to the five in industrial challenges that were identified before. Now I will discuss the corporate profile of Honda in regards to its organizational characteristics. The first item is Honda's culture. It permeates the entire organization. The three joys, the joy of buying, selling, and creating are what make Honda 
a unique organization and one of the industry leading organizations. Also, the respect for the individual is what makes Honda such a creative organization. The organization values creativity and embraces paradox and tension you know, as room for discussion. Along with that is R&D. R&D was set up to be an autonomous subsidiary of Honda, and that's basically the foundation for why it is a special organization. R&D doesn't really have too many financial constraints on it, like a typical R&D organization would, and they get to kind of set some of their own um, strategic objectives in terms of the types of research that it wants to do. Um, one of the assets of R&D is because they receive so much financing from Honda Motor Company is that they have state-of-the-art facilities and they also use a localized strategy for geographic responsiveness. There's an R&D facility in the United States, there's one in Japan, and then there's R&D centers, smaller ones throughout the world uh, that respond to uh, local tastes and preferences in design. Operations is, as you know, the bread and butter of Honda. It's where all the sales come from, and uh, it has a strong global presence. Um, you know, at each of the in each of the six regions, there throughout operations, you will find a focus on efficiency and flexibility, just-in-time inventory, limited automation which in turn also leads to better associate engagement in work processes. And then finally, Six Sigma quality optimization, uh, the attempt to try to reduce defects from the product. I'm now going to go into some of the support functions that make Honda such a special organization. The first topic is HR. Uh, HR is known for cultivating workplace diversity throughout its um, hiring practices. It looks for people that, you know, maybe didn't come from an automotive background but can bring some other assets to the table and offer a unique perspective. Um, also, policies support corporate culture and strategy initiatives throughout the organization. So HR is very adhesive. It's, you know, um, again, just as strong as almost the culture itself. Uh, information services is also very effective. Uh, we have throughout the world a highly competent staff that's effective at managing information databases and then coordinating information across um, the globe so that you know, managers and leaders throughout the organization can make effective decisions. And finally, um, marketing not only in North America, but throughout the world is one of, you know, the best within the industry. Um, you know, they emphasize best value pricing across the product por portfolio, um, using market segmentation uh, by demographics and regional preferences. They can kind of tailor products uh, to meet, you know, certain tastes. Um, also with our expansive dealership network, in the U.S. and abroad, we can, you know, the distribution channel is very effective at getting products to consumers in a timely fashion. And then finally, with, you know, a variety of advertising mediums such as TV, radio, web, and social media, Honda can effectively promote its product. The final aspect of the corporate profile looks at the financial analysis and health of the company. A few of the metrics that I talked about within the strategic analysis, um, which I have all uh, emailed to all of you, um, goes into these metrics, but I'll just touch on them briefly. So the debt to equity ratio, uh, as you can see, it's below the industry average, which it's not necessarily a bad thing, but for a growth strategy, we need to look at, you know, maybe find financing more through debt. Um, also, our inventory turnover, it's 8.12. Uh, 
that is below the industry average, which is a good thing. It means that products are selling in a timely fashion. Finally, uh, return on equity, 8.77%. Uh, while it isn't high within the industry, it is a 76.4% increase year over year from last year. So that is an improvement and um, you know, shareholders can rest at ease knowing that you know, profits are increasing. And then finally, earnings per share year over year um, was up 78.96%, which shows that there is an anticipated future growth in stock. And also kind of tying in with the financial aspect of the company is the current strategy positions that Honda has adopted. So Honda has a two-tiered strategy approach right now. Uh, our corporate level strategy involves intensive strategy aimed at growth um, in saturated markets such as the US and Japan that comes in the form of product development and in uh, brick nations and emerging markets it's basically market penetration in in terms of a uh, business level strategy right now we're pursuing type 2 best value which correlates with our uh, mission statement so this includes low price, high quality products, and a product that is saturated with segment leading features and attributes. So kind of transitioning into the uh, strategy that I am proposing, my team conducted a uh, SWOT analysis, as you can see here, um, you know, assessing the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats available you know, externally and internally. So we started out conducting an IFE and an EFE to you know, kind of gauge what our um, you know, environment was, both internally and externally, and then the output of that was this SWOT matrix. So I'm not gonna go into the entire matrix, um, but as you can see, this slide shows the strengths and weaknesses. And this, this slide shows um, some of the opportunities and threats that um, exist within the industry. So from that list, I then, you know, me and my team worked on a series of candidate strategies that combined all the outputs from this, the swap matrix. Um, this particular slide goes into the strength opportunity strategies and then the weakness opportunity strategies. So in terms of strength, opp strength opportunity strategies, uh, one of which is to provide extensive training for dealership networks. Um, we feel that that's very important, not only in North America, but in any market. Uh, also, capturing 2% growth in emerging markets through flexible manufacturing and regional localization of product offerings. Um, as an intensive strategy, we feel that that's very important. And then finally, for SO strategies, um, using our know-how as an engine manufacturer to provide a greater suite of fuel-efficient crossover vehicles. For uh, WO strategies, for WO strategies, For, w, for WO strategies, there are three as well. The first is to implement global leadership training efforts to enhance mid-level leadership capabilities uh, and to promote strategic objectives in emerging markets. The second is to reduce organizational inertia through increased emphasis on collaboration and establishing a greater sense of urgency. And then the third is to capitalize on emerging Asian markets to achieve enhanced product diversification and balance global sales. And then the uh, second half of the candidate strategies then delve into the strength threat strategies as well as the weakness threat strategies. So there are two of each, the strength threat is to refine diversified product portfolio and address the needs of the growing millennial target market. And the second is to leverage economies of scale, 
establish supply chain relationships and global market presence to thwart competition from tech companies and specialty OEMs such as Tesla. And then for weakness threat strategies, uh, our first was to reduce product cannibalization by devoting 25% of our portfolio to specialty vehicle production. And the second is to increase domestic sales incentives to offset the hike in federal interest rates. So from all of those strategies, we then looked at three alternatives that were you know, fairly aligned with what we're currently doing. Um, the one that we ultimately chose was to achieve minimum 2% growth in emerging markets through flexible manufacturing and regional localization of product offerings. So similar to what we're doing now, it's an intensive growth strategy. Um, it scored the highest in the QSPM analysis that we did. It scored a 4.42. Um, this strategy was chosen ultimately because it was consistent with present strategy and organizational capabilities. It satisfies the objectives of the 2030 vision and it leverages competitive advantages in localized manufacturing and economies of scale. So now that I've discussed those strategies, I'd like to discuss how we are going to implement them. So in order to implement these strategies, it involves a four-step process. The first of which is to re-examine the present capital structure. That includes more borrowing from lenders and leveraging debt. The second step includes uh, targeting the Chinese market. They have exhibited the most stability out of any of the emerging markets and we need to maximize our presence there. The third step to implementing this strategy is to continue product development uh, and best value strategy in saturated markets, such as the US and Japan. And then finally, we need to continue to invest in other brick markets after they have demonstrated stability in sales. The final phase in the strategy plan is evaluation of the strategy itself. Um, I suggest evaluating strategy quarterly or even more periodically just to see if it's deviating from the original plan. Uh, there are four uh, metrics that you need to use in order to you know, effectively evaluate your strategy. The first of which is strategy consistency throughout the organization. Um, you know, all parts of the organization need to be working towards the same goals. Second is a correlation between the um, trends, the strategy trends and the actual strategy itself. If trends start to shift, then the strategy needs to change as well. And then um, the third item is you know, ensuring feasibility, making sure that, you know, you're not straining other resources in pursuit of the strategy. And then finally, uh, the fourth is competitive advantage and market position, making sure that you aren't sacrificing any of your current advantages that you have um, in the industry. So that concludes this presentation. If anyone has any questions, uh, feel free to let me know, or um, if anyone has any later, uh, feel free to send me an email. Thank you.